Guys, um, I, I don't know if it's just me. I told Bernard that it's so important for me not to impose my thoughts spiritually or otherwise on you. I try so hard not to um, because I don't want you to marinate in something I'm sensing that might not be accurate. Um, but at the present time, there is a level of stress in our world that has reached pandemic proportions. I'm not talking about normal stressors in life, like work stressors. Everybody has stress at their job. Or financial stressors. Or marital slash family stressors. I'm talking about the stress brought on by fear, insecurity, and uncertainty. We constantly hear about wars and rumors of wars, terrorist threats and terrorist attacks, anarchy and corruption, the threat of economic collapse, heinous and violent crimes, and governments becoming more and more dictatorial and totalitarian. <laughs> Just look at what fear does physically to us, for instance. Fear weakens the immune system and can cause major cardiovascular damage. Fear causes gastrointestinal problems such as ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome, as well as decreased fertility. Fear can lead to accelerated aging and even premature death. And this is just the physical ramifications. You can only imagine what it does to us emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I want to share with you some advice from the Bible. With that being said, I am well aware that the theoretical aspect of what I'm going to share with you is much easier than the practicality of it. It's very easy for somebody to stand up here and tell you what you need to do and preach to you, even at you. You know that's not my style. You know I, like you, walk through this life, and I've had my fair share of ups and my fair share of downs that I've had to have, uh, that I was challenged with. Um, but, you know, Bernadette is very different from me, um, personality-wise. I don't think she worked on it. Um, I think it was God-given. She is very even-keeled. She tends to see the silver lining in a cloud. Uh, she tends to see the positive. It's actually incredibly annoying trying to live with her. <laughs> and, and I don't say that with, with any comedic value. Um, because if, if, if I cut my toe off on the lawnmower... She'll either say one of two things. She'll, she'll say that, which I don't know about you, but it's not something you want to hear when blood is spewing from the place that used to have a toe. Or she'll go, I told you not to cut the lawn yourself. Um, but I don't tend to always see the silver lining to a cloud. Um, I have to work on it. I really have to work on it. So if you're like me, um, you can understand where I'm coming from. With that being said, I want to go with what, what I think, obviously, will, will help us. And like Bernadette says, the alternative stinks. I told her it's very hard to go over Bern because so many people are going through difficult circumstances. And yet, if we don't take this approach, it only gets worse. So first and foremost, I'm going to make a few points the first point I want to make is trust in God. Now, you've heard this a million times probably, and this has to be a jumping off point. In the Bible, it says over 70 times to not be afraid. Obviously, God manufactured us, he knows us, and he knows that fear is a big part of who we are. 
And that's why he reiterates over and over again. Because just as any good parent, and I got to believe that just about every parent in here, if not all, are quality people, you don't want your child to be afraid. If they're afraid, it's upsetting to you. And God is our Heavenly Father, doesn't want us to be afraid. But he can't force us not to be afraid. Let me show you one verse. It says, when I'm afraid, so it's not if. Now, I don't know, guys. I, I wasn't raised in the church. I don't think there's anything wrong with being raised in the church. But some of you who were, you just learned Christianese. You learned what to say. You learned when to bow. You learned how to say, too blessed to be stressed. I got news for you. It didn't help anybody. It didn't help you because you went home with your fear and your insecurity. It didn't help the other people who were going through it. It was like a big fake show, a big facade. And God's saying right here in the Psalms, when I am afraid, when you are afraid, he's saying when you are afraid, meaning it's a given. Now, some people are more fearful than others, but I could tell you something. There's something called severe mercy. Be very careful how you look down on your nose at somebody who's fearful because I'm going to tell you something. Something's going to happen to you to cause you to wake up and realize, oh, that's what it was like. Ask some of the people here who have never been to the hospital, and now they have a spouse, or they themselves were there. All of a sudden, they have a whole new sensitivity for people that have been there. So be very careful how you judge another believer, because with the measure you judge another believer, be careful. Maybe not everybody's as strong as you or as faithful as you. That doesn't make them less of you. If anything, you should help restore them and encourage them through their fear because the Bible says you who are spiritual, you should restore. So if you're not in the restoration business, you've got no business calling yourself spiritual. This verse right here is faith speaking. This is faith speaking. When I am afraid... The psalmist is saying, when I am afraid, I will, I will command, my spirit will command my soul to trust in you. It is based on the character of God, not on your faithfulness. Listen to me. It's not on your faithfulness. It's on the faithfulness of God and his promises. We know he is more powerful than all the enemies combined. And he has promised to protect us from harm. Nothing, and let me repeat, nothing can penetrate the protective hedge which God sets up around us except by his permissive will. This is why we can trust in God without fear. Just think back and dwell on all the times in your life when your back was up against the wall and you thought, there's no way out. This time, there's no way out. This is the big one. But God. Not but us. It wasn't our faith that brought us through. It wasn't. You might think that. I'm here to tell you humbly, that is a mistake. It is the faithfulness and the goodness of God. Two, name me one biblical promise God has reneged on. One. One. We must remember that the good shepherd is always with us, even in death, dark ravines, Psalm 23, 4. We don't need to be afraid because he will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. And he is our strength, he is our song, and he has become our salvation, Exodus 15, 2. When I was walking down the beach recently and preparing, God was preparing me for this message, I said, Lord, there's so many people struggling. There's so many people walking in such fear, gripped by it, and you want me to help them. What am I supposed to tell them? He said, tell them to trust me. I said, i got to have something more than that. I'm not sure that's enough for me. If it's not enough for me, how am I going to make it enough for them? He said, son, tell them to trust me. And I'm walking down the beach where I used to live in Ormond. And I don't know if you know much about Florida, but when it's 46 degrees, it's like 54 below. Nobody goes out. 
I don't know if their blood thins out, but nobody goes out. So I was walking the beach all by myself. There was nobody for miles. There's a beautiful stretch of beach where it's just dunes, about 15 miles. There's not too many places like it. And I was walking, and all of a sudden, there appeared a very, very old woman. She was Asian. I found out she was Chinese, actually. And she was just a little bitty woman. She couldn't be more than four and a half feet. And she was wearing a coat and a hat. And I see her appearing out of nowhere. And God says, she's going to, she has something for you, son. Go see her. And I went up to her and I said, what do you have for me? And she hands me a track about trusting in the Lord. <laughs> and I have that track. Number two, do not focus on the fear. Again, easier said than done. But to focus on the fear is to invite in more fear. We open up this window and it just keeps coming. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. All of a sudden you fear something and then it's just worse. Yes. Then, then this, this pimple becomes a festering boil. Then the festering boil is a cyst. Then the cyst is cancer. Then it's stage four. And then you're thinking what songs you want at your funeral. Now, I'm not saying not to pay attention to a lump. I'm just saying fear invites more fear. God wants us to focus on the one who takes away the fear. That is to find our peace. Look at Philippians 4.8. This is the conclusion of the matter. There's no letter like this. This is, this is Paul's first congregation. This is his baby. And he says, brothers, focus, concentrate your mind, your thoughts. Think about this on what is true and what is noble and righteous and pure, lovable or admirable, on some virtue or something praiseworthy. So, so here Paul is giving the believers in Philippi advice regarding their thought life, their thought life, which how many times do you think in the day and what percentage would you say it's about yourself? Even if it's a meeting, there's so much focus on ourselves. The Bible everywhere teaches that we can control what we think. I'm not talking about positive thinking. That's silly and it doesn't work, okay? It is useless to adopt a defeatist attitude saying we simply cannot help it when our minds are filled with unwelcome thoughts. It's not true. It's scientifically not true. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, God tells us in the Bible that we can. Scientifically speaking, the brain was manufactured with the ability to think about one thought at a time. Therefore, a person cannot entertain evil thoughts and thoughts about Yeshua at the same time. Everything that is true and noble and righteous and pure is found in Yeshua. He's telling them to dwell on Yeshua, not to dwell on yourself. You might have looked at that and said, oh, I can dwell on some of the noble things I've done. No, 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 no. Listen, true means not false or unreliable but genuine and real. That's Yeshua. Yeah. We are lied to at every turn. I know some of you read some newspapers and you go, no, this is honest reporting. Sure it is. Yeah. You just got lied to again. Yeah. Yeshua cannot lie. Spend time with him. Talk to him. Nobility. Noble means honorable or morally attractive. There was no sin in him. None. Righteous means just towards God and man. He loved both. You'll meet many a people, many a believer, who love God with all their heart. But not so much they feel the same way towards their fellow man. Pure refers to high moral character. Lovable and admirable means pleasing and worthy of praise. So what do we have so much to rejoice over, especially today? Well... There is only one son of God. Yes. And to think that he was willing to come to earth as a man and a bondservant at that, not stopping at healing and teaching, 
but he went all the way to death, even death on a cross. Now you and I have a future like none other. The people at Philippi were being persecuted for their faith. And he said, rejoice. I tell you, rejoice, because this is not the end of the story for you guys. Look at Mark 5.35. This is an, a section of Scripture that I'm sure you're very familiar with. While he was still speaking, that's Yeshua, people from the synagogue's official house came saying, your daughter has died. Why bother the rabbi any longer? Now, the ruler of the synagogue, which was Jairus, or the official, as some of your versions say, in modern times, the synagogue president, it's called the synagogue president. You're probably not familiar with that, but the synagogue president is the big cheese. I know Bill is watching right now. He's been a synagogue president. They're the big cheese. They run the show, believe it or not. The ruler of the synagogue was responsible for choosing readers or teachers in the synagogue, examining the discourses of the teachers, and seeing that all things were done with decency and in accordance with ancestral usage. You know, the the synagogue president, if they had anybody speaking, they would go over all their notes and all their scriptures. I would never do that. I have a right to do that, but I trust the Lord. Most synagogue rulers were actually Pharisees, which isn't a terrible thing, by the way. Pharisees were separated ones. As Jairus, the synagogue leader, was bringing Yeshua home to save his daughter, you have to understand, this was in the Galilee. Yeshua taught at his synagogue in Nazareth. He was well-respected. He wasn't a weirdo. He was a Jewish rabbi who was very well-regarded. Otherwise, he wouldn't be teaching in the synagogues. And they knew he had great power, and he sought him out. But then he receives the news that his daughter had died. Immediately, what does Yeshua say to him? You read the section, he says, don't be afraid. Just keep trusting. Don't be afraid, just keep trusting. In other words, Jairus had a focus not on the tragedy and the fear, but he had a focus instead on faith and the Lord's nearness. We must remember that the same principle when faced with a fearful situation, again, I know when we're in the thick of it, it's not easy. I've been through it with you. I've been through it with myself. I've been through it with my family. Habakkuk 3.16. Are we there? What's What's the next slide? Praise the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. Forgive me. Um, Let's take a look at the next verse. When I heard, my whole body trembled. My lips shook at the sound. Weakness overcame my limbs, and my legs gave way beneath me. But I wait calmly for the day of trouble when it comes upon our assailants. Habakkuk, which is the way it's pronounced, the prophet, was fearful of the invasion of his country. God told him, Babylon, I'm sending Babylon in to destroy Israel. And he was fearful. He was gripped by fear. He describes his fear here graphically. He had to wait patiently for the destruction of his people. Can you imagine the situation he was in as a spokesperson for God, knowing that there's going to be havoc? Not a little tornado that's going to come by and take out some houses. This is going to destroy the whole nation and bring them into exile. A horrific invasion. But look at what he says in verse 17, 19. You'd almost think, what was this guy on and how can I get some? (laughs) He says, for even if the fig tree doesn't blossom, meaning Israel, and no fruit is on the vines, even if the olive tree fails to produce and the fields yield no food at all, Even if the sheep vanish from the sheep pen and there are no cows in the stalls, still, guys, you know how transparent I am. I don't think I would have said that. And I don't think too many of you would. And make sure before you say you would, you're careful because it might happen to somebody in your family and God's going to put you to the test. Still, I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Elohim Adonai, the Lord God, is my strength. No matter what happens, Habakkuk has decided. He's practiced this. He's worked it out. It didn't just happen. You have to practice it. So when it hits the fan, you're prepared. It's not going to just happen. He decided he will trust the Lord. He has learned over the years that he can trust God. And with that trust comes great joy. Not in the circumstances, but in God. We've had a great run in this country. Do you have any idea how spoiled we are? America has become a giant convenience store. We have anything and everything. Now people shop online. You can get it in a day. Packages coming to people's houses every day. Buy now. Buy now. I don't even think that's good enough. Soon it's going to be like, why can't I press a button and you put it in my hand? It says buy now. I want to have now. It's out of control. It's not that horrible. It's just that we've been ridiculously spoiled. To the nth degree. And it still wasn't enough. He purposed himself to focus on the Lord's power and the Lord's promises. And with that focus, Habakkuk learned to not be afraid, and he ended his prophetic book on a note of rip-roaring praise to God. Number three, remember the future God has promised us. Now, I have gone over with this with you. How many times have you heard, no tears, no fears, no pain, no suffering. And I'm sure after a while you're like, oh, enough with that, Rabbi. Make it like that now. It's not going to be like that now. God never promised us a rose garden. In fact, he promised us just the opposite. He said, in this world we will have tribulation. We, we rode this wave of prosperity, crazy prosperity. It was like a no-brainer. Put some money in a, in a fund, and it's just going to grow, man. You, you can't miss. And so now we're, we're like, wait a minute. Everything's not great. So it says, remember the future God has promised us. To focus on it, to think about it, to dwell on it. So I do dwell on it. If I didn't dwell on it, I would become a depressed person. I know my personality. I would absolutely, positively be depressed if I focused on the here and now. Look at 1 Peter 1.3. Praise be God. By the way, all these letters were written to people that were being persecuted. Just on a side note. Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who in keeping with his great mercy has caused us through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead to be born again to a living hope. These aren't just words. As sinners, we had no hope beyond the grave. You know this. You're born again. We just forget. And we focus on other things. The business. The business. The business will outlive us. You can't just leave behind. That can't be your legacy. There was nothing to look forward to except judgment and fiery indignation. That's what you need to focus on. But in Yeshua, the claims of justice have been met. And now mercy can flow out to those who obey the gospel. The resurrection indicated God's complete satisfaction with the sacrificial work of his son. The resurrection is the Father's amen to Yeshua's cry when Yeshua said it is finished the father yelled amen mission accomplished the resurrection also gives us you and me the assurance that we too will be raised from the dead and this is our living this is here our living hope 
There is no greater hope than this. I'm not hoping in the future. I'm not hoping to get a better house. I'm not hoping to have a better life. I'm not hoping to see the Great Wall of China. This is my hope. 1 Peter 1, 4, the next verse. It's too rich. I couldn't put them together. To an inheritance, a living hope, to an inheritance that cannot decay, spoil, or fade, kept safe for you in heaven. The inheritance of ours cannot corrode or crack or decay. Nothing can tarnish or extinguish our secure inheritance. It is bulletproof and it is sin-proof. And not only that, but because it does not fade away, it is also time-proof. It's not the same with earthly inheritances. The value of an estate can drop significantly. Ask any lawyer. Wills are constantly contested. And if they're not contested, lawyers will figure out how to contest them. And there are legal technicalities that get in the way. Not so with our heavenly inheritance. Look at the last verse, 1 Peter 1, 5. Meanwhile, through trusting, you are being protected by God's power for a deliverance ready to be revealed. It's ready. It's done. But not yet. Soon, but not yet. It's done. You have it, but you're going to get it in the last time. God has it under lock and key in a vault in heaven that makes Fort Knox look like a post office box. If this was enough, we're told that our bodies will be changed and glorified in the twinkling of an eye. How can you appreciate that if you had perfect health? And we will be forever free from sin, sickness, and death. Come on, somebody. Shout hallelujah. I tell you this all the time. We spend an exorbitant amount of money and time fixing ourselves. Creams and lotions keeping us young. And all we want to hear is, you look great. How old are you? You look great. My God, you look great. That makes our day. Not, wow, you have incredible character, young lady. And the children that you raised, what character? That takes a back seat to you look great. You look great. You look great because you had good genetics and you spent $40,000 on pearl cream. That's why you look great. And if that doesn't work, see a doctor, right? Get this tucked, that nip, this pulled, and you'll look great. You look great. You keep pulling your face up and keep having the facelifts, your belly button's going to be on your back. <laughs> Number four, combat the temptation to fear. Let me show you a picture of something. This was something that they put on the beach right where I lived. I noticed it while I was walking, and I thought, man, what is that? So I walked up, and I just want to read you a little excerpt. Following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, the American government placed a high priority on civil defense throughout the Second World War. Their coastal watchtower was constructed and staffed by civilian volunteer spotters. Armed only with binoculars and a telephone, they monitored the skies for air traffic and watched for signs of German U-boats that operated just offshore. This tower was one of over 15,000 observation posts along the Atlantic, Gulf, and Pacific Coast to warn of an impending attack. The observation posts were abandoned in May of 1944 when it became apparent that the Germans no longer posed a threat to our coastline. Few towers survived after the war. This is one of the last remaining towers right there in our neighborhood, in that suite. We are not just sitting in an observation tower. We are on the battlefield, soldier. We are in a fight. This battle we are in is spiritual. I know everybody in here probably has guns in their car, guns in their house. That's not going to fight the enemy. One of our enemy's go-to weapons is to promote fear. That is his go-to weapon. And as believers, what should be our go-to weapon to combat this fear? Well, since our battle is not flesh and blood, conventional weaponry won't do the trick. So we have to resort to some spiritual weaponry. 
Now, you've heard the armor of God time and time again, right? You've memorized it. When our kids were little, we got them the armor. I want you to hear it for the first time. First of all, you should know that when Paul wrote this, he was in prison. So being a Roman citizen, one, he was all too familiar with the elite Roman guard. So he's using armor as a metaphor. Two, as he wrote the epistle, he was probably being guarded by a Roman soldier in full armor. So he says we need full armor. In other words, one or two pieces won't do the trick. It has to be in its fullness. We do not need to be occupied with the subject of demonism. You know, I told you that. These churches, bind, they, I bind Satan, and then next week I bind Satan. Why did you let him out? Why didn't you keep him bound? It's ridiculous. We don't have to live in fear of demons. Let's take a look at the verses. Ephesians 6.14, it says, Therefore, based on the fact that the enemy is relentless, stand, that's step one, don't lay down, don't give up, don't get discouraged, not at this juncture, you've come too far, we've come too far, the end is in sight, I see the light at the end of this tunnel, we have to press on, have the belt of truth buckled around your waist, Put on righteousness for a breastplate with the simple rouse. Paul is rousing his troops. Stand. He's asking us to withstand the enemy and not to give in to fear. First and foremost, he says, you've got to wrap yourself up in the Word of God. Not just speak it. That's not going to work. It has to be richly in you. It has to be richly in us so that it comes out in times of trouble. When I boxed, when I wrestled, when I did martial arts, I practiced so much, I didn't have to think. I didn't have to think. Sadly enough, when somebody grabbed my arm, it was a bad deal for them because I reacted. Bernadette remembers a couple of times with friends of mine. Yeah, sadly enough. Even when they were fooling around. I said, I don't want to fool around. And they would throw a punch, and I'd duck and throw a punch, and then they were in the ER. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying it became second nature. That's what we have to do with the Word of God. Putting on righteousness means doing the right thing. We have to do the right thing. We can't speak the right thing. We have to do the right thing. A man that is clothed in practical righteousness, he's impregnable. Impregnable, I tell you. Ephesians 6.15. Wear on your feet the readiness that comes from the good news of Shalom. Our feet must be wearing evangelistic shoes. I don't know if they sell them at DSW, but get a pair if they do. An individual that doesn't share with the lost is a lost individual. We have the truth and righteousness protecting us. Now it's time to go on the offensive. On the offensive and invade the enemy's territory with the good news. Light dispels darkness every time. Ephesians 6.16 Always carry the shield of trust or faith, which which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The enemy will fight back with his fiery darts. What are they? Fear, discouragement, frustration, confusion, and the worst, divine betrayal. Divine betrayal, where he wants to convince us that God forgot about us. And he aims these things at our hearts and our minds. So we must use this faith shield to shield us. Ephesians 6, 17, last verse here. And take the helmet of deliverance along with the sword given by the Spirit. That is the Word of God. This is the helmet of salvation. No matter how fierce the battle gets, the believer is assured of victory. Assured, just as he is assured of his salvation. In other words, don't take your helmet off. Do not question your salvation. Even these people that are out there that are trying to say, well, you're born again, but because you're doing this or doing that, your salvation is history. Nice preaching. You're preaching out of your own insecurity, not out of the Word of God. People say, can you lose your salvation? The Bible didn't even speak about losing your salvation. The Bible asks, are you saved? That's the question. Last but not least, take the all-important Word of God in the mighty power of His Holy Spirit and slay all day. Slay all day. Slay all day. Go on the offense. 
Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of being a believer. Don't let them put you in a corner. Do not cower. Do not lie down. Do not be embarrassed of what God did for you. Everybody's come out of the closet these days. Christian, come out of the closet. Now let's take a look at a little end day stuff and we'll get going. Revelation 17, 1, 2. Then came one of the angels with the seven bowls. This is the end of the story. And he said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is sitting by many waters. The kings of the earth went whoring with her and the people living on earth have become drunk from the wine of her whoring. The whore of Babylon or the mystery of Babylon makes war against the true saints of God and is best interpreted as the ungodly end-time religious system. The ungodly end-time religious system. And it appears that many are jumping on the bandwagon and drinking the Kool-Aid. 5 and 6 of Revelation 17, it says, On her forehead was written a name with hidden meaning, Bavel, the great mother of whores and of the earth's obscenities. I saw the woman drunk from the blood of God's people, that is, from the blood of the people who testify about Yeshua. On seeing her, I was altogether astounded. So much for the magic carpet ride. Her name, mother of whores and the earth's obscenities, represents the lust of godless societies for sensual pleasure and their rejection of all restraints. They cast off all restraints. Her becoming drunk on the blood of the saints reveals that societies that defy God, which is where ours is, united with the relentless pursuit of wealth and pleasure, will exercise ruthless, political, and coercive power to silence the godly. This is upon us today. For the people is nothing more than a t-shirt or a tattoo. Do you hear me? Revelation 18.4. Then I heard another voice out of heaven say, My people come out of her so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not be infected by her plagues. Come out of her as a warning to God's people to escape judgment. That is to come upon Babylon the Great. The false religious system had her time of influence when the kings of the earth committed adultery with her and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. But she is the subject of God's wrath and she'll be judged along with all those in bed with her. In times of judgment, God always separates his people from those being judged. This took place when God judged the world in Noah's day, when he judged Sodom and Gomorrah in Abraham's day, and when he judged the Egyptians in Moses' day. Therefore, believers today are told in essence to come out of her, that is to separate from the wickedness of this world. Revelation 18, 9 through 10, the kings of the earth went whoring with her and sharing, shared her luxury with sob and wail over her when they saw the smoke as she burns, standing at a distance, not even crying over their souls but crying over their loss of funds. Like in, and it happened in 1929. Men who were wealthy, when they lost their wealth, they threw themselves off from 100 Wall Street, jumped out of a window because they had no money. They could have started over. Oh no, the great city, Bavel, the mighty city, in a single hour, your judgment has come. During the tribulation, when the people of the world see the destruction of Babylon the Great, they will mourn for the loss of their riches, pleasures, and luxuries. When her fall comes, her lovers will stand off at a distance in fear and horror, but it will be too late to distance themselves from her fate. Kings will mourn Babylon as the mighty city that God judged in a single hour, suddenly and swiftly, when his patience had reached its limit. But those who have come out of her and who have been persecuted by her will celebrate. Look at 1820. Rejoice over her, heaven. Rejoice over her heaven. Rejoice, people of God, emissaries and prophets. For in judging her, God has vindicated you. While all these godless tears are being shed on earth, there is a great rejoicing in heaven. At last, hallelujah, how long we say, how long at last, God has avenged his saints, his emissaries, his prophets. He has judged Babylon for the way she treated his people. What a magnificent transition. What a magnificent transition from mourning to dancing. Yeah. Let me bring this thing to a close, kids. At this point in time, there are three roads to travel, and only three roads to travel in these last days. Number one, the first road is what I call the hard-hearted road. 
This road is characterized by hypocrisy, self-righteousness, immorality, and worldliness. This road is none other than the wide road that Yeshua warns us about in his Sermon on the Mount. It is the wide road filled with self-indulgence and earthly pleasures. The end of such a life is destruction and separation from God. If this road were a freeway, it would be called the highway to hell. It is a freeway as the only cost is your soul. This is a road that you can get all too comfortable on because it's nice and wide and well paved. You'll want to exit off this road as soon as possible. The only way off this highway is taking the exit mark repentance. And it's not hard to locate because it's the only exit shaped like a cross. This is the only way to the narrow road. Road number two, the second road is what I call the half-hearted road, characterized by a lukewarm spirit. This is a road marked by pride, ignorance, self-sufficiency, and complacency. You hear terminology today like, I got this, you got this, we all got this, or the ever-popular, it's all good. First of all, what planet are you living on? I don't got this, you don't got this, and we don't got this. God's got this, and do you know why? Because the only thing that is all good is God, period. Today, more than ever, we have many a half-hearted believer falling prey to the traps on this road set by the world system. This is a system built to manipulate us into thinking that we can have peace and joy without God. This road is not emphatically the wide road, but by the same token, it's a lot wider than it should be. This is the road that has many people fooled into thinking they are walking the narrow path. We have to use our GPS, the God positioning system, get us recalculated and get us back on the narrow road. Of course, the third road is the road less traveled. It's the wholehearted road. If this road were a highway, it'd be called the holy highway. You have to remain very alert driving on this road as the road tends to be quite narrow. But there's good news. If you are committed and dedicated and you refuse to look to the left or the right at the billboards. By the way, all the ads on the highway are lawyers that are saying if you're involved in a car accident, you're involved in a car accident because you're looking at the billboard that says where you're involved in a car accident. Don't look to the left or the right. And don't look down on your phone. For God's sake, stop texting and driving. And if you want to, do it on a country road where you kill yourself, not an innocent driver. Then you won't veer off the path. You won't veer off the path, and you will arrive safe and sound to your destination promise. Throughout time, there were devout men and women of God who remained faithful and resolute, no matter what. No matter what. People say, is America changing? Where have you been living? Where do you live? Choir practice, and, and, and you go to the Veterans Club? America has been changing for years and years and years. The 60s changed America. And the 70s made it worse. And the 80s and the 90s, for years now it's been changing. But it doesn't matter if America becomes a goat nation. Madam, make sure you don't become a goat. Don't worry about America. Worry about you. Joseph was in Egypt. Was that not a goat nation? How did he do? Daniel was in Babylon. Was that not a goat nation? How did he do? Mordecai was in Persia. Is that not a goat nation? How did he do? And what about Naksang in India? Do you know Naksang? Naksang was a Garo man from the tribe of Mahalaga. It was from the northeast district of India, then called Assam. In the middle of the 19th century, about 1850, he became a believer through an American Baptist missionary. When the chief of the tribe found out, they put him on display. He had a wife and two children. When he told him to renounce his faith, Knox Hank said, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. They put two arrows in his two sons' hearts. Then he said, Knox Hank, renounce your faith, or next to your wife. He said, though none joins me, still I will follow. And they took out his wife. Knox Hank, last chance. You're next. He said, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. Are you familiar with those words? Yes. yes, that was written. His final words were composed in a hymn by Sadhu Sundar Singh, himself a Christian missionary to India in the early 1900s. 
The fact is, you don't go at it alone. He knew this all too well. You don't go at it alone. Look at the last verse, Matthew 28, 20. Remember, exclamation point, remember. I am with you, Yeshua says, even to the end of the age. Yeshua promises his disciples that he would be with them until all things are consummated. In other words, his presence would be with them, not just in the last days, but up until the very last moment. In all their service, in all their travels, they would never be alone. Here's the great news. A promise to his disciples 2,000 years ago is a promise to us today. It is impossible for Yeshua to desert his own. Impossible, I tell you. So at those times when you think you just can't make it, the Lord says you will make it. And you know why? For I am always with you, even to the end of the age. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Do you remember the first time we heard that song? I was in Daytona Beach. We just moved there. I was a new believer. We went to that Christian bookstore. And that woman, she was about, what, 119 years old. She ran it. But then her son came out, big burly guy, Bobby. He was a surfer, a druggie. He got saved. And he said, what music do you listen to? Remember, no matter what we said, it didn't matter. The cure. He had a Christian cure, you know? But Christafari, remember that reggae banks? We liked reggae. They sung that song. I thought they did it. Can you imagine? All these kids are singing this, and this is about a guy that let his sons right in front of him. I've decided. No turning back. Unbelievable, huh? Just unbelievable. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.